All right. Welcome, everybody, to Archive Dives with Oxen AI, where we dive deep into archive papers. There's a lot of gems and hidden knowledge in these research papers, but there's also a lot of research papers out there. So the main motivation is to sift through them, find the best ones, and keep up with the latest and greatest in the field, and just become smarter oxen as a community. So if you're new here, welcome. If you're watching on YouTube, feel free to join us live at oxen.ai slash community. You can join the Discord as well as join these live sessions and ask questions as we go through the paper. Today, we're going to be diving into the DPO paper by the team at Stanford. We also indexed a lot of data to give you examples into Oxen of how you could use this in your actual work. So we'll dive into that as well as go into the nitty gritty details of the math in the paper as well, which uh, looked a little intimidating at first, but I hope that uh, as we go through it, it will gel and it's actually not that bad once, once you dive into the details. <laughs> Calling out, here's the link to the actual archive paper. Feel free to follow along there. This research is done by team at Stanford, um, led by Christopher Manning, who also has a ton of great YouTube videos and lectures that are free online. I, I definitely recommend checking him out and following him. But let's start by diving into why this paper is important and what they are optimizing for. So large language models in general start by being trained on large data set of text and have been shown to acquire a surprising set of capabilities, whether it's building an AI coding assistant or a creative writing assistant. We want the model to be able to understand a wide variety of knowledge. And the authors state in the intro that we want LLMs to understand the nuances of languages and that there can actually be multiple valid responses to a single prompt. They call out, for example, if you're creating a writing assistant, uh, you could, or sorry, an assistant that is writing code, there's excellent code that compiles and runs and is fast. But there's also poor inefficient code that also compiles and runs and gives the same output, but might be a little slower or might not fit your use case. Both are technically valid. One is just preferred to the other. Another example is in creative writing. We want the model to be aware of common misconceptions believed by 50% of people, but we don't want the model to claim this misconception to be true. So how do we balance all of the knowledge that the model already knows with the preferences that we want uh, from the human that is training it? So uh, the, the main takeaway about this DPO is how do we build AI systems that match our preferences, are safe, performant, and controllable? And at the end of the day, DPO is a simple method uh, simple approach, much simpler than reinforcement learning from human feedback, which we'll also go over from for going for a model that knows a lot to a model that behaves like a human wants it to. So a example of going from a model that knows a lot to a model that behaves like humans want to is ChatGPT, which we all know and love. And Typically, when it comes to building an end-to-end -end system like ChatGPT, there are three steps. There's the unsupervised pre-training, which is typically done by a big company with lots of money. Think Llama 2 or Mistral or the original GPT-2s. Um, I think Llama 2 was estimated to be 5 to 20-ish million dollars. I forget the exact <laughs> amount of compute that they use, but um, what's awesome is a lot of companies are releasing these pre-trained models and they're kind of like raw building blocks that we can build on top of. 
The next step is supervised fine tuning, which you'll see in the paper abbreviated as SFT. This can be done by you, tailored to your use case. And then finally, uh, in the Instruct GPT paper, they talked about reinforcement learning from human feedback, which is also could be done by somebody without that much compute, but it's a little more complicated. It requires an extra model in the step in the in the full pipeline and requires a method called PPO for optimization. We went over the instruct GPT paper in all its glory in a previous dive, so we're not going to completely go over it here. Um, but the idea is once you have your base uh, pre-trained model, First, you do your SFT fine tuning, then you get a bunch of data that um, starts with a prompt and has four or N valid responses to it. So the prompt might be explain the moon landing to a six year old. The valid responses might be A, uh, explain gravity, dot, 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 B, explain war, dot, 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 C, moon is a natural satellite, et cetera. They had a person in the loop rank these responses from best to worst. And then they trained a separate model in the loop to try to predict given a prompt and response pair, uh, which one of these do we prefer? So uh, that's what they call the reward model. And you'll hear reward model a lot in the paper. And the final step in the full reinforcement learning from human feedback loop is to take that model, the separate model that you learned, um, take a prompt, generate a response, have the reward model rank it and give a scalar value out and then feed that back into this PPO algorithm to optimize the responses that you get out of this LLM. And we had a great question in the Discord um, a week ago that was asking, it occurred to me I don't have a great understanding of something as LLMs go through the refinement, pre-training, supervised fine-tuning, RLHF, PPO, DPO. Does the model architecture change, or is it just the training task used to update the weights? And I think this is a really valid question that sometimes people uh, brush over. And so I thought a little diagram like this might help clear it up, clear it up. So you have your pre-trained LLM that was trained on massive, massive web scale text. Um, you take the exact weights from that pre-trained model and just fine tune them or copy them over for your supervised fine tune model. You can train this model end to end, or you could add a technique like LoRa or QLoRa on top of it to make the supervised fine tuning a little more efficient. But at the end of the day, it's the same amount of weights. You've copied them over and you've kind of updated them given this instruct data set. And in the, in the context of reinforcement learning from human feedback, you make two more copies of that model. You make a reward model from the model, and then you're going to be fine tuning a final version of the language model called PPO. The reward model, they remove the final unembedding layer of the model and pop on uh, a layer that can simply just predict a scalar value, um, but it, it maintains all of the weights from the supervised fine tuned model. And then the PPO model also copies all the weights over and is just optimizing for a different objective. So I hope that kind of clears up the, are we using the same model between the three pipelines? And what's really cool about DPO and what makes this paper uh, interesting from a practical perspective is we remove the need for this reward model at all. So it just goes from pre-trained LLM to supervised fine-tuned model to DPO optimized model. 
And if you were to grab some like open source models off the shelf, if you searched for Mistral AI and Mistral 7B V01, that's like the raw pre-trained language model. And then somebody took that, they ran an instruction tuning data set over it and created Mistral 7B Instruct V2. That was actually the same team from Mistral that did both of those. And then people have taken Mistral 7B Instruct V2, given it a comparison data set and created a bunch of models off of that. For example, Dolphin 2.7 Mistral 7B DPO. So you can kind of see how these things expand out um, over time, given different types of data sets. So with that laying the context, um, let's dive into what DPO is. And at the core of it, it is the loss function that is the main, um, the main contribution of this paper. So to fully understand the magic behind DPO, we must dive into the math. Um, the loss function is the most important part of the paper. And they say you can replace the reinforcement learning aspect of reinforcement learning from human feedback with a simple classification loss. So that sounds great in theory, but let's, and I mean, classification is like that 101 <laughs> machine learning task that, that we all know and love. Um, but when you get to the actual equation that they derive, uh, for one, it kind of like made my eyes glaze over as soon as you got to this. And for two, they did a lot of work in the paper deriving this equation from the reinforcement learning equation they had before. So they're talking about like optimal policies and they're talking about reward functions and all this stuff. So I'm going to try to break down all of these variables that we have in this equation in terms that hopefully we can all understand and then talk about why that is such an improvement um, over the full reinforcement learning pipeline. Hey, Greg. Greg. Yeah. So, so the from a big picture standpoint, the huge benefit here is that you're replacing all, all of the manual um, work of the um, reinforcement learning with human feedback with simple with math, basically with with a loss a loss optimization function. Is that is that correct? Yeah. So you're removing the need for an extra reward model in the cycle. So in um, reinforcement learning from human feedback, you copy the supervised fine-tuned model two times. You create one of them that's a reward model that's going to like given a prompt and an input, just say, or given a prompt and a response, say how good this response is. And then that feeds back into yeah. this PPO algorithm. And so what they're doing in this step is just removing the need for two models and shrinking it into one with a clever loss function. And one of the things I read about the downsides of RLHF is it's something like the instability. It's they describe it as being very unstable. What is what, what is that? Do you know what that means when, it, when people criticize a model as being unstable? What is, does that mean like non-deterministic or? Usually, well, in this context, they're talking about the stability of the training process itself. And so when you add an extra model into the training process, you're adding more um, oh. complexity. And now you have two things that you're trying to optimize instead of one. Um, mm -hmm. So getting rid of that extra complexity makes it more stable and easier to train end to end. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Any other questions before we dive into the loss function? Yeah, so Ben's got his hand raised too. Yeah, I, I was reading this. I'm trying to find it in the paper, but I, I think they said they had like a closed form solution for basically making the reward model. So like instead of learning it, you just solve for it directly through this math equation. I think that's like technically the term for it, but I'm not confident. Uh, does anyone know? Yeah, so I think they proved that you can go from the reward model um, math to this classification loss um and they do some 
fancy math in between there to get you to this simpler loss function um, is what my understanding was. Thanks. Cool. So let's dive into the loss function. The loss function at a high level is a measure of how well our model is doing given data. So at the end of the day, if we can minimize the loss, we are winning. Um, and so I liked to start by breaking this down into a much simpler version of the equation. Let's just say loss equals winner minus loser. <laughs> and if you kind of zoom out of this equation, we can call this half right here winner and this half right here loser. Um, and they add just like a little negative sign at the start. So really it looks something more like loss equals W or negative W minus L just to flip it to a minimization problem. Um, and so what would be an example of W and L? So let's say we had a prompt that was Oxen AI's data version control dot, dot, dot. And you wanted your language model to complete those thoughts. And one of them said it's data version control gives you visibility into changes into your data over time, simple, easy to remember commands and workflows that mirror Git. And then the other one said Oxen AI's data version control is hard to learn because they throw a bunch of new lingo at you. And if we as a company wanted to train our reward model, we would give a thumbs up to this first one and a thumbs down to the second one. So this would be W, this would be L, and in the context of the equations, this prompt would be X. And so what we want is we want to get a high score for W and a low score for L. And if we do that, the total value within the parentheses here is going to be high. And then if we put a negative in front of it, we can minimize that. So zooming back up to the equation here, obviously it's not just a W here and an L here. They have um, these probability distributions on the top and the bottom, and then they have logarithms and they have beta parameters and they wrap that all in a logarithm with a uh, sigmoid. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot going on here and I wanna dive into what each one of these are. But if you can understand like winner minus loser, that's kind of the high level framework here. So um, looking in, oh, I ask, I, yeah, I wanted to ask something, um, but you don't have to like answer right now. It's just what I'm wondering. I guess what I'm, what I've really been wondering about this is like, you see how the loss includes both the winner and the loser in it, both in the yes. same loss function. Yep. Like it seems like they're kind of, you're trying to bias it towards the winners and lower the losers, but could you not just like, if you go to your really simple example, could you just make, I'm just wondering like why you couldn't do this. Um, could you add an extra line and I'll, I'll just tell you what I'm see, like thinking. So it's like loss equals like winner and then just type in like W and then your loss, the next on the next line, loss equals negative loser. Like, I'm just wondering like, if you just change the loss function based on your example, um, like, is that just like a simpler reformulation? Cause I, I feel like, I have to be missing something, but that's why I bring it up. And I'm, I'm curious to see if that gets answered. Yeah. My intuition for that is then you'd have to run back, back propagation twice for that. So like, you'd have to run it. I mean, once for the winner and once for the loser. And then if you're batching all of these together, um, you would have to put like all the winners in one batch back propagate it, all the losers in another okay. batch back propagate it. And this just I like see. combines it into one. Okay. Yeah. I see. Cause you get the, you get the winner and the loss, uh, the losers in the same update yep. instead of two different ones. Okay. Yes. Okay. That, that literally answers the question. Thank okay. You. Great. No, that's a, that's a really good question. Cause there's a lot of like nuances when you look at all of these things. And I think breaking it down in terms of this makes it much easier to digest. Um, Greg, one more in the chat too. Uh, the question was from Osterog. What is pi theta in the loss function? Is it the model parameters? Yeah. Yep. So this is what we're going to dive into next. So you'll see that there's a pi theta uh, y given x, yw given x. 
there's also pi theta y l given x and then there's pi ref y w given x and pi ref y l given x and we're going to dive into like each one of those so let's start with pi theta y w given x so this is y is always the output x is always the input so x is the prompt y is the completion w means the winning one so the one we want and then this pi theta is the probability distribution across the whole completion um and what they do in the paper is you when you have two different district or i'll start i'll start here so this is the model that you're learning and this is the base reference model that you trained so this is like the pre-trained llm and there's this term called kl divergence which is a measure of how two probability distributions uh, are related to each other, so how close they are to each other. And so for this, for both sides of these, you're kind of optimizing this KL distribution to be close to each other. But let's look at the pi theta to start. So if we did this example of like trying to complete this prompt, um, let's break it down into what the actual math under the hood of this would look like. So if you had like Oxen AI's data version control, and then we're predicting each word in the output with a specific probability. So like gives might be 0.8, U might be 0.9, visibility might be 0.8, et cetera. And then is hard and two are going to have different probabilities coming out. They literally just sum those up they do some log probabilities within it to make it more stable, but you can think of it as just like the sum of the probabilities that came out of the model for this example. Um, and so that's what the pi theta is. And what took me a little bit to wrap my head around was you also have this pi ref. So what's the difference between pi theta and pi ref? Well, pi ref is just the base language model that you've trained that already has all of this knowledge built into it. And what they're saying is, yes, we want to optimize our new language model to give um, a high score to the, the completions that are winning, but we also don't want it to drift away too far from the original language model. So back to like our original problem statement of we want it to know about a lot of things, but we want, <laughs> we, and we want to maintain that knowledge, but we also want to optimize and have it prefer certain ones than others. This is how we maintain our existing knowledge while optimizing for the Ws over the L. And so they kind of do that on both sides of the equation here. They divide, divide by the sum of the log probabilities from the reference model. Um, and that's a really clever trick to kind of both keep the knowledge that you had before and keep the language modeling um, capabilities that you had before while optimizing the preferences at the same time. Um, so I'll pause there because I know it's like, it's literally a lot of Greek <laughs> that we're trying to break down. Um, but Evan, go ahead. Yeah. I I like when I see this many letters, I think I have the same reaction as everyone else, which is holy shit, that's a lot of letters. Yeah. Are we still talking about math? Because there's no numbers, it's just letters. Uh, totally. So it looks like you have the uh, KL divergence of the, which is like a probability, it like measures the distance between probability distributions. So yep. essentially, you have the distance of the probability distribution between your winners and your language model, and you have the probability distribution or the, the difference between your losers and your reference model. And then essentially we're subtracting, which means we're talking about the difference. So we have the difference between the distance of the winners in the reference and the distance between the losers in the reference. Yep. And then it looks like on the left, we have an E and then like the log just maybe looks like some random normalization crap right there. Yep. Yep. Uh, that doesn't really matter. And then the, the E is kind of like the expected value. So it's kind of like if you had compressed the entire distribution and like kind of like rolled the dice enough time to get your expected value, we're trying to maximize the difference between the two distances. So we're trying to 
take the distance of the winner's probability distribution and make it as far apart from the loser's probability distribution. Yep. But it's While normalized. maintaining this. Yeah. It's normalized because of the reference. Um, so that way that that way it doesn't it doesn't skew away from what it's learned. It's only learning the difference between the winners and losers, but nothing else. Uh yep. That's that's that I would say that's a really good we, summary. Yeah, I think the minus at the beginning is probably also kind of unintuitive. The minus is confusing and the log sigma thing is confusing. The beta is also confusing. It kind of looks like <laughs> you could almost remove all of those and like kind of maybe make it easier to get the point across. That's what I'm kind of talking about. Like, I feel like ML papers kind of love to obfuscate the core idea by like yeah, spraying they, numbers and letters. They do. And that's, I, I would say these are important and they're like hyper parameters that they've had to do some exploration to find. So even in the paper, they say like a beta value of 0.1 works really well on this data set and 0.5 works really well on this data set. Um, but sometimes they do kind of just feel like mathy intuitive shots in the dark where they're like i know it wants to be a little smaller so i'm gonna make yeah. it 0.1 and i know i need to normalize these probabilities because just summing across them without taking the log is going to blow up in an optimization problem um but yeah the core idea i think is much simpler than what it looks like on paper yeah i bet when the researchers were actually talking, they probably said something like what I was saying, and then they decided to write down <laughs> what you're seeing on the screen. Yeah, I, I also, I am like, I'm probably not at that level of math from just, but just from reading other people's reactions and from looking at the derivations they made at the front and the back of the paper, they definitely did a really good job of showing how this maps directly to reinforcement learning with human feedback and like kind of had theorems to prove this stuff. But at the end of the day, I think it is a lot of intuition of like, let's keep these distributions close to each other. Let's upweight the winners and let's downweight the losers. Cool. So I hope that oh, clears I just, up I, the I, loss. Sorry. Function. I just, I just, so I think you can actually reformulate, wait, this, so you know how I was saying the log sigma is really confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, also like, I realize I could be maybe getting off track here. So like I can stop. Uh, if it's quick. Uh, yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, so we'll basically um, there's like a log trick where like, if you, if you have like the difference in a log like that, it's actually kind of like dividing logs. So like it's actually, I think the KL divergence of two KL divergences, <laughs> like you can reformulate this, mm. I think. I, I, I would have done to... my log. Think about that a little no more. Yeah, I would have to look the, at my log. You see what I mean, well. though? Like the the log of the two KL divergences um, in your equation. You scrolled away from it, but yeah, yeah. Um, you could reformulate that as the KL divergence of one divided by the KL divergence of another. Like, sorry, you could probably it would yeah, be uh, the KL right. divergence between the two. Yeah, yeah. I think totally. it's probably clear that way. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I think. Now that we've broken it down, like you can even start playing with stuff like that. That's pretty cool. Um, so cool. Love all that breaking it down. Um, and I think putting it all back together. First, you sample two completions from your reference language model, given a prompt X, and then you optimize the new language model. Um, and so this was pi ref. Uh, pi ref. You optimize the new language model, pi theta, to minimize our loss. The model gets rewarded if the completion W has a higher probability than the completion L. And the model gets rewarded if the completions of W and L are both close to the original model. So pretty much just reiterating exactly what Evan just said. Um, and so when it comes to experiments that they ran, they did two main experiments. One was generating sentiment and the other was uh summarizing reddit posts so um for the sentiment generation task you basically have a data set that is uh all of these imdv movie reviews i'll link to the actual 
data set on Oxen, but I want to go through this a little more quickly because we're running through time, running out of time. But if you want to check that out afterwards, you can like dive into what these actually look like. Um, but the prompt is going to be a, pre a prefix of the movie review. And then the policy or the language model, whenever they say policy in this paper, they mean language model, must generate a completion Y with positive sentiment. Um, so there's a bunch of examples in this data set that are already labeled, whether this is a positive movie review or a negative movie review. So they kind of use that data set as a labeled preference data set, and they're trying to get their generative model to just generate positive movie reviews. And that's how they're going to evaluate it. So going back to our X, Y, W, and Y, L, if you had like Iron Man was, Y, W would be the best movie of all time because blah, blah, blah. And then they have a sentiment score of positive nine. And then you have an alternate completion that might be the worst Marvel movie I think I have ever seen, which has a negative sentiment of 0.1. And they're saying, can we take this supervised fine-tuned model um, and get it to generate more positive statements than negative ones? So the first step is they perform supervised fine-tuning on just the train split of the movie reviews themselves. So they just teach the model how to uh, generate movie reviews with no constraint on positive or negative. And then uh, they take just, they take the label data of positive versus negative and reformulate it as a preference data set and um, generate more positive sentiment um, examples. And so, it was interesting when they did this experiment, the main result that they showed was how the reward um, maintains high for DPO over different KL divergences of the trained model and the reference model. Um, so they want, the model to be able to maintain uh, generating positive reviews, even if it drifts away in terms of KL divergence. And the way that they did this is a lot of those hyperparameters that you saw at the top of like beta and um, some learning rates, they did like 22 different samples of DPO and 22 different samples of PPO, which is the reinforcement learning, um, and they just showed that DPO is more stable in terms of aligning it to generating positive sentiment than the other ones. Um, it's not like the most intuitive graph to wrap your head around, but that's how they evaluated this one. And then the next task that they evaluated this on was summarization. So for this task, they took a forum post from Reddit as the input, and then the LLM needed to generate a summary of the Reddit post given the Reddit post. And so there's a data set called Reddit TLDR um, that already has all of these summary summarizations and human preferences for which summarization is the best. Um, so that's the second task they did. And so for this task, first, they performed supervised fine tuning on the Reddit responses, um, just to get the model to learn the instruction of like, summarize this text. And then they took Anthropic's helpful and harmless, harmless dialogue data set containing 170 different dialogues um, between a human and an assistant to align the model with preferences. Um, so again, like a two-step process. And for the TLDR task, they use GPT-4 as the evaluator of the task. Um, and so here, what they're plotting is they have DPO versus PPO versus the super, the plain like supervised fine-tune model versus just like 
prompting a GPT J model. And you can see um, the X axis is a bunch of different sampling temperatures, but consistently across different temperature values, DPO had a higher win rate of this is a better summarization than PPO and um, the supervised fine tune model itself. But what's interesting with PPO, and this might go again to your question from the beginning, Cameron, is see how PPO just works really well for this low temperature, but is less stable as you get to high temperatures. I think that's another stability factor that they're calling out here is that this DPO method seems to be more robust to shifts in hyperparameters, which makes it easier to train in general. So both of yep. these graphs are kind of getting at that quality. Cool, thank you. And so they also, um, obviously ground truth, uh, could be like humans going over every example and saying this example from DPO is better than this example from PPO. I said they automated some of this with GPT-4, but they also conducted a study uh, to justify the usage of GPT-4 in this evaluation. And granted, the sample sizes are pretty small, but super interesting. Um, oh, shoot. That is a little <laughs> hard to read down here. Um, but the takeaway here is they had um, human respondents and they had GPT-4 respondents. And they looked at the agreement between the humans and the agreement between GPT-4 um, with two different prompts. And they said that it was about the same uh, agreement score between GPT-4 and the humans. So it's much easier to evaluate this with GPT-4 and more scalable than hire a bunch of people to do this. Um, so that's how they justified using that in the evaluation. Um, and I guess to say that more clearly, <laughs> GPT-4 tends to agree with humans about as often as humans agree with each other, suggesting that GPT-4 is a reasonable proxy. So in conclusion, uh, DPO is exciting because it reduces the overhead of taking a model from a pretty good supervised fine tuning model to a high quality uh, model that's aligned with your preferences. Um, I love this analogy from Jan LeCun from a few years ago. You guys might be familiar with it, um, but he talks about if these different stages <laughs> of machine learning were a cake, um, the very initial like self-supervised pre-training would be the insides of the cake, the supervised learning on top of that would be the icing, and the pure reinforcement learning would be the cherry. I almost like to think of it as like, this, this came out in 2019 before a lot of the foundation models were released publicly, um, his initial talk where he referenced this. I feel like if I was gonna update that to today, I would say that the self-supervised pre-training is literally like all the farmers and the fields where they get all the ingredients from and they do all the processing and they get the cake ingredients to the store <laughs> where we could go and just download it. The supervised learning is like baking it yourself and picking the flavors and making it your own cake. So that's like something we can all do ourselves. And then the reinforcement learning on top of it is more like, how do we make this cake look beautiful and put the icing on top and put the cherry on top and like supervised fine tuning can get you to something that's edible and something that you can use on your own, but the reinforcement learning makes it presentable at a wedding or turns like a base model into a chat GPT. So I uh, just wanted to use that analogy to hopefully drive the point home. 
so with that being said, um, they also have, they mention in the conclusion that there's a few more experiments that they would love to run all of the experiments in this paper, since they're an academic lab, um, trained models up to 6 billion parameters. So seeing how well DPO works on larger models remained to be seen when this paper was published. And it also remains to be seen how well DPO can generalize to out of distribution data because they only ran it on a few different, the sentiment task and the Reddit summarization task. Um, but what's cool is since this paper came out, people have permitted it on a few more tasks with a few more models. Um, and there's even some research coming out of how you can use DPO within like a self play technique to see if a language model can improve itself simply from sampling from itself uh, and running DPO in that loop, asking it to assess its own outputs. And we'll dive into some of these like self play papers next. Any questions, anything you guys read in the paper that I think I didn't cover? Anything that's still confusing? There was a ton of action in the side chat, uh, <laughs> and, but there's a lot of questions and answers. So if Great. anyone still has like a burning question that they want to raise their hand and maybe jump on and throw in the chat again, now's a good time. Like um, I'm, I'm, the, the sidebar is crazy right now. I'll it, also I export would... all these and put them into the blog too. If that's helpful for people. I think the more meta thing is like, is anyone else having problems with the Zoom chat? Like I, I scroll up and it just like <laughs> literally pans me to a random part of the screen. And then I scroll up a little bit more. It goes back down up. It's like, I'm rolling a dice here and I don't know oh, what message yeah. I'm talking about. I think that's because people are replying in Yeah. So as soon as you reply yeah. it actually scrolls. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't just me though. Cause this is, this is like absurdly hilarious. Like this is like someone, someone signed off on this at Zoom. And they got paid a billion dollars and they were like, you think we should make the chat better? And they're like, ah, nah, nah, leave it. Uh, Zoom, if you guys want to sponsor this YouTube <laughs> channel, we'll cut all of that off the end of the video. <laughs> but until then, we leave it in as a bounty. No, just kidding. <laughs> cool. Well, other than I'll put all the chat in the in the blog post. Um, we actually have some new people at Oxen that are helping with a lot of the content stuff. So I'm excited to get them up and rolling and hopefully the production value goes up a little bit. Okay. Um, uh, we have one question, Alex is raising a hand and also we're singing your praises because you can't always see it, but we're getting some <laughs> praise for today's lesson. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and thanks Alex, for everybody. Do you want to jump on and say anything too? Yeah, I just wanted to, to uh, re-mentioned the um, Hugging Face Alignment Handbook that I shared earlier. I'll, I'll dump it in chat again. But they had a really interesting blog post that takes um, the results of DPO and compares them to uh, IPO and KTO, which are even more <laughs> recent um, alignment techniques. Um, and I actually found it really interesting because I read the blog post uh, maybe a week ago, and it looked like uh, IPO was doing quite poorly, but they just published a, an addendum where they, they found a correction and actually updated. So there's, you know, some responsibility involved there that I wanted to applaud. Totally. Love that. Uh, what, do you know what data sets they're evaluating this on? I'm just curious. Is it like a general task or? I don't recall. Cool. I definitely will dive into that since we at Oxen love the data. Um, <laughs> that's like our bread and butter. Cool. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and for anybody else watching on the YouTubes, we get together every Friday, do this virtually 10 a.m. Pacific time. If you want to join, it's just oxen.ai slash community. We'll put that link in the YouTube video. And uh, thanks, everybody, for joining. We're going to stick around a little bit to talk about the paper a little more. And even we're creating a data set as a community. And if anybody that stayed around last week um wants to stick around on the call this week i want to just show you guys how we can do that on the oxen platform but if that doesn't interest you feel free to bounce right now hey greg you want to mention the discord yeah and we have the discord as well um 
if you used to go to oxen.ai slash community, there's a big button there to join the Discord, and there's a lot of smart people in there answering each other's questions. So love, love to have you. And Scott's there too. Scott is there too. Smart people and Scott. Just kidding. Smart people and Scott. <laughs> That's an excellent phrasing. Honestly, I'm like, I was telling Ben, I'm like pretty decent at math and holy moly today was, it was a, a bit. Same reaction <laughs> to Evan. That was a lot of letters in one formula. It's all Greek to me. <laughs> <laughs>